Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second webinar in our special series to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Pope Francis's Laudato Si on care for our common home. Hello, everyone. A special welcome to our panelists today, Elizabeth Lopez Canelas of Bolivia, Sherry Pictou from Nova Scotia, Canada, and Berta Zuniga Caceres of Honduras. Thank you so much for joining us. We will introduce you properly in, in a few minutes. My name is Anne-Marie Jackson. I'm director of the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice, and we're based in Toronto. Our webinar today is in English and in Spanish, thanks to our translators, um, Pat and Magali. As long as you have an updated version of Zoom, um, you can choose in the bottom right of your screen which language you, language you would like to hear. Um, technology is, of course, a constant problem and challenge. Um, so just remember to turn on your interpretation button um, when you need it and off when panelists speak in English. Um, we hope it works for you. Um, in case of a problem, please uh, write uh, that in the chat window. And we're recording this webinar. En el chat y estamos también grabando este webinar en serio. Ir al botón uh, abajo uh, que dice interpretación y escoger right. español. And choose the Spanish or the English, whatever you wish. When the panelists are speaking Spanish, would please turn off the interpretation button and then put it on when you need it again. Okay, thank you. Through group dialogue. The hope is to build trust and friendship, and that this process will foster a change of heart and open mind, open minds of those who participate. We want to, at this moment, offer words of solidarity to communities of color and indigenous peoples everywhere for the violence of racism. We mourn for the family of George Floyd. We remember those who have died in police um, incidents in Canada, including most recently Dondre Campbell and Regis Kuczynski Paquette. And we keep in mind indigenous peoples killed in similar circumstances, as well as the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls whose homicide rate is actually roughly 4.5 times higher than that of all other women in Canada. We recognize the privilege that we have of being white as a call to action that requires collective work to distribute more evenly both access to power and to resources. And we humbly dedicate our work to justice for all. Let us begin by acknowledging sacred lands upon which we live and work. We acknowledge this land as a living community and all its inhabitants, animals, birds, water creatures, insects, the fungi, the microbes, all of whom sustain life. These territories where the, where have been the site of human activity for over 15,000 years. This land from where I speak is the territory of the Huron Wendat and the Batoon First Nations, the, um, the Onondawaga, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and uh, Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations. Today we meet on these lands which are still the home of a myriad of living beings and the home of many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge all of them with gratitude and remember our sacred responsibilities as treaty people. We try to say these words with conviction and as a constant reminder of our responsibilities. This event is being co-hosted by, um, with Kairos Canada and, the, and Canadian Jesuits International in Toronto. 
Thank you to them. Our webinar today is a way of exploring the meaning of on care for our common home. Resource extraction is a fundamental question in, in Laudato Si, but we note that in the text doesn't really refer to gender issues. So today we want to go deeper and to put a focus on the impacts of extractivism on women. Well, we have an hour and a half and no more. Um, of course, there will be an opportunity to ask questions and um, there's a question box at the bottom of your screen. You can put questions there. And the questions can be put in, in Spanish or English. Our colleague Victoria Blanco will join us a little bit later for the questions, um, so look for her. And now <clears throat> I would like to invite Jenny Cafiso, Director of Canadian Jesuits International, to come and introduce our first speaker. Jenny. Hello. Um, good morning and good evening, depending on where everyone is. Uh, thank you, Anne Marie for uh, this um, opportunity to um, share with the forum and Kairos uh, uh, this important event. So our first speaker is um, Elizabeth Lopez Canelas, and I'm uh, honored to be able to introduce her. Um, uh, she's the first of our three speakers. Uh, Elizabeth uh, is, uh, es una antropóloga, ambientalista y feminista quechua, que ha trabajado durante más de 20 años acompañando a diversas organizaciones indígenas y campesinas, en particular a organizaciones de mujeres en la defensa de sus derechos sociales y ecológicos amanezados por la empresa extractiva. Actualmente Elizabeth trabaja con una organización que se llama Terra Justa y también pertenece al colectivo Territorios en Resistencia. Y con eso uh, le doy la bienvenida a Elizabeth. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. Gracias, Jenny, eh, por la introducción. Thank you, Jenny, for that introduction. I really appreciate that. I also want to thank Mark for having invited me and for having done all that you did to make this possible, this event. In a special way, I'd like to thank Mark for having prepared this event, but I also wanted to say that it's very, I'm very emotional because in a conversation with Bertita, I really don't know her personally, individually, but I do know her and we have been at the same round tables uh, discussing. And so I'm very happy to be at the same conference as she is. In this presentation, I live in Bolivia. I was born from, I was born here and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the context from which I want to speak to you. And as a Bolivian, it's only possible to explain what is happening here because this is the territory that, hmm, that has been, has undergone a great deal of uh, resource extraction because of the great wealth and the great richness of our natural resources. We have mining, which is very, closely rooted to our lives, to our history, all of that in our way of being, right? I also am working for the longest time now um, with Jenny, working with and setting into place different projects and processes to help the women, Indigenous women. And so when I, now that I've set the context a little bit, I'd like to begin my talk. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you about three different stories. The three different stories that I feel are very much part of this mining problem and also what women are having to go through for the extraction of resources. We have Juana. Juana is an Aymara who lives in who is Coro Coro, who lives in La Paz. And so uh, she works for a copper company, one of our state governed. We have three types of mines. We have the state and we've got the small mining companies and we've got the medium. We don't talk about the big companies yet. We talk about the, the, the how much how much they produce is what makes us. So anyway, she works for this middle-sized company and she was telling me a few years ago that 
she they had never asked they had never been consulted about the expropriation of the land right so the meetings that took place in her in her little pueblo and was between the miners and the representatives of the community who are the majority men and so there was she was monolingual aymara she didn't know spanish but she was a woman and she was alone because she was widowed and so she went to school and she but she, she couldn't read the documents because she didn't know spanish so juana never really understood what was happening going around what was being said around her and so all of these lands she lost them and nobody would even step forth to try and help her at all so she had to change her way of life totally change it the second story i'm going to tell you about is about medina medina is also someone who is an older woman from a community called Pio Ponte from the northern Amazon region, region in Bolivia, where there is a great deal of gold mining, legal, illegal, all kinds. In, in the zone, there's a very big presence of mining co-ops, okay, cooperatives. Some are very small, and, and they were they were under like a social umbrella and there was a great deal of flexibility for them to be able to work in this area but also there are many advantages for example the the cooperatives even though they are very small can be entered into partnership with private enterprises and others and so that is why in the zone there is a great deal of extraction that is totally out of control we have Chinese people, and we also have big companies from Colombia. We have Luisa. Luisa had to, she had to, Mirina, she had to leave her land, give it up. And there was, you know, a, a, a kind of like a meeting of the minds between the people who live there and between the miners. And these are communities that are all dispersed, you know, in small little areas, small towns, villages. And so, oh, they came and got took their land away from them in a very physical, violent way. So they took over all of their lands. Um, Doña Luisa and her daughters and her children spoke out and spoke out and they used the means of modern communication to be able to say what they wanted to say to communicate it. And they were hoping that they were going to be able to defend the rights of these communities. But despite the fact of what has happened in these various activities over all these years, she was never able to succeed to get her land back. So we have all of the documents with all the administrative, you know, paperwork and everything that had to be done, but never, never were these denunciations brought to the fore or, or, or looked at or, or studied. Another third story, another is of Doña Casimira, she lives in Pokerani. Pokerani is situated in the department of Potosí in the south. And Doña Casimira, just a little while ago, was telling me how she had experienced kind of like the introduction, the coming to of a mining company to her country. How it happened. So she said it was kind of like a medium sized business and they had come to take over the lands of the people and to start their production. So her, her family were minors and so the crime, the crime of, you know, taking over all of the lands of the people that was never looked at it was never investigated nobody ever looked into it but in her memory she just saw the whole thing unfolding before her eyes they took away her mother then they took away her land so the results of that is that she immigrated to the city of potosi she talked she worked doing what she could right very informal types of jobs and once she was able 
to get out of the hospital and she got a little bit older. She started talking with other people from her land who had been expropriated and they started asking for their rights to be respected. So that took over 30 years of a struggle and finally she was able to recuperate her lands. The lands of Doña Casimira had been expropriated by the mining company in order to establish themselves in, oh, they wanted a tennis court. They wanted, they took her land so they could build a tennis court there for the recreation of the miners. Anyway, in the last couple of years, what she was able to do was re get her land back. And then she went back and she started gardening. And now she's in this process of being able to guarantee that there will be water for the people in the community. Well, after I'm, I'm telling these two or three stories because I think it's important. There are very, there are three, I mean, there's so many elements, but there are three here that I'm going to talk to you about that are of great interest to me that I want to highlight for you. The first one in the first story is that we visualize and are able to understand the structure of what is existing there, our social structure in existence. What we've learned is that the buildings, that, that the companies, like those that, that do it very, very well, that with a great deal of expertise, as soon as we start touching upon the social rights of the people, the basic social rights of the people, they know exactly how to get in and how to negotiate with the people. They use a language that is very masculine, very patriarchal. And so they kind of like get the people, like they kind of fool them and get them on board for their own profits. And so when this whole social structure begins to fall apart, it's very important that there be a process of resistance or one of social justice. Usually these processes to try and build up once again the social fabric of the people, they're going to attack the older people and of the children also, the children and the older, because it's going to generate a whole lot of disputes among them. And because of the economy and what they can get e access to economically speaking. And so we had to see what is the social fabric in the community the people don't protect it, they don't protect each other, they don't help one another, and this facilitates the whole thing to just crumple and just crumble and just fall apart. And she was a widow and she didn't have the opportunity to be able to defend herself, especially uh, she was, like I said, monolingual, unilingual. Then the second story is of great interest. And the ideas that I wanted to bring out was to talk to you about the, the case in Bolivia, for example, we define ourselves as a mining country because of our history, because of this imagination that we've created because of the colonization and because they have come and pillaged our lands and taken over. And so we are very, very poor. And there are zones where we, um, we have the extractivism of the natural resources has been very harmful for us. So they have come up, we have now built a dynamic that is at the service of the various companies or, or there were kind of like uh, elite, no, there's a neat class that are also part of this. So what we have to do is try and generate a whole series of norms that if we know what the rights of these people are and the, the protection of the women who try to defend them from violence, and that of the, the rights of the environment and everything. So the rights of women, the rights of the environment, like water, for example, as being one of the essential rights, one of the basic rights of all people. So th there was a whole series of norms that were, self that were set in place that was kind of like uh, uh, to, to, to help us, but in practically speaking, they are not efficient at all because there's no flexibility of, in these norms, first of all, but also because because of the generation of omissions. So what we're talking about, the states, okay, the governments do not generate a direct presence to see that these norms are, re are respected or we don't give any type of follow-up. So if we speak out, they should be there. They should be with us to see what's happening to the environment, but they don't even come close. They won't even come. They're not gonna come. They won't come to the buildings or nothing. And what they're do, they're going to leave us, they're gonna leave the people to defend themselves on a permanent basis. 
one of the dramatic cases in that happened in, in the case of Uburu, it was another mining area, it was a, communi a community in Bolivar in the, in the mining zone, and the women lost everything. They Little by little, they took away everything, right, from them. So even today, the community, if they want water, they had to move away from there to be able to get fresh, have access to fresh water. But those who remain there have, we have to bring them in by truck once a week. So there is no control. That's what happens. And so things just develop and just, they do as they want. My third um, story, it is one of injustice, structural injustice, because we have to look at this. These, these stories are like jumping off points for me to help you to understand what's happening. Because of this, there is a systematic approach of kind of like dispossessing them, themselves of everything. And this dispossession of things has to go with the injustice there. When Do Doña Casimira was telling us that her mother had been, you know, killed and nobody helped her nobody tried to do anything at all they're the ones who would have to act because nobody would help them so now they are trying to go back to that place they're going to go back to their history they're going back to their past so as not to forget hmm? so now we're building up this new history this new story especially this area of uh, injustice because to talk about it because once you generate this systemic type of injustice that people don't believe anymore. They don't have anybody to believe in, and so they just give up. And so in the community, this is something that it would seem to me very basic. And that's why I'm talking to you about it. So now she's gone back home to Angas. She was, they were, they had, uh, she had been gone through expulsion from her community, but she's gone back now and she's trying to help the people. And this is something that is extremely important, particularly in communities uh, like the mining companies are installed there because they're present there in all of these areas. The last story, hmm, it would seem to me is basic. It's fundamental because that explains what is happening in the other stories that I talked to you about is that all of them, all of them, all of them, because of the different circumstances, they all went back to their homes to try and, you know, just take it over to be able to have a little bit of a garden and produce the food they needed. And they went, they went to help themselves, they, but they want to take care of their children. They want to take care of themselves with the type of, with the type of drinking water. And so this is a very technical, very natural how the minings degrade they degrade not the systems but even then your body is affected and your children are affected by this so it just goes on and on so these companions went back home and they are working now in their own territories and they're setting all types of possibilities to assist the others but people you wouldn't even have an idea i mean but they're so so far away these places i'm talking about they're so far from the cities urban areas in my country Be i believe that this is what i want to talk to you about the idea that i am convinced that the struggles that don't seem to be very big struggles but all of these very concrete in themselves are very serious and this creates a necessity to strengthen micropolitics, to work. This is the work we have in our hands, and this is the right that we have to take up and defend this search, this quest for justice from the recomposition of our social fabric. And, and then, so the challenge is there to be able to establish it once again, even if it's just for water, to be able to sow the seeds, to water the seeds so that it would be healthy. so that we don't lose these. So I think that there is a little bit of hope that comes from this very long history and these memories of these women. And so that is going to be all for me right now. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that very interesting presentation. And uh, we can tell that's a lived experience yourself and that has been a huge contribution for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I'm sure that there is going to be many questions and many comments. So you have to 
we're going to just wait and ask you to wait. So I'm going to say thank you once again, and now we're going to go to our second presentation. Dr. Sherry Picto, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to and honor to introduce um, Dr. Picto, who is a, a Mi'kmaq woman from Lisekuk, um, which means water cut through high rocks. And um, I, I know I didn't get the pronunciation quite right, but she said it wasn't bad. <laughs> um, and uh, known as the, the Bear River First Nation in Nova Scotia. Uh, she is an assistant professor in Women's Studies Department at Mount Sinai Vincent University and is making the transition to serve as assistant professor in the Faculty of Law and Management at Dalhousie University. She's also a former chief of her community and former chair of the World Forum of Fisher People. Her research interests include decolonizing treaty relations, social justice for Indigenous women, Indigenous women's role in food and life ways, and Indigenous knowledge and food systems. Uh, we, it is with uh, great pleasure that we welcome you and we look forward to your sharing with us uh, your reflections. Thank you, Dr. Pickle. Okay, took me a while to unmute there. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction and thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing those stories. Uh, two different contexts, but uh, some similarities, particularly around um, land dispossession and the lack of consent and how this impacts, uh, particularly the gender impacts uh, for Indigenous women. Um, I'll probably skip around here, but I'll just start today because I was interviewed earlier this morning, um, about a year ago, actually a year ago yesterday, June 3rd, <clears throat> uh, we had the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's uh, Inquiry final report released. Um, so this was June 3rd of last year. And for those of you who uh, have been Pay attention to the news because we are in this pandemic the government of Canada made the announcement that that doing anything about that report was going to be put on hold because of the pandemic and I find this very concerning because um, if you can just bear with me with this storytelling because and when that final inquiry came out, there was 231 recommendations. And some of the strong recommendations like um, were in, with governance. There's reasons why Indigenous women have not been participating in governance or they've been excluded. And also that there had to be some gendered impacts when it came to assessments, when it came to resource exploitation, and it's particularly in the extractive industries. And so this, uh, this report was released a year ago, and then about a little over two weeks later, the Trans Mountain Pipeline was approved in British Columbia. And as we well know, there are camps um, out in, in British Columbia, uh, led by Indigenous women, uh, Wasutin, Frida Hudson, and uh, others, the tiny house warriors with Kanahos and so forth, um, been in years long struggle against these pipelines. So now I wanna jump ahead. Here we are on the anniversary of this report and the pandemic is being used as a reason for not um, acting on those 231 recommendations. And I'm a, I've been around long enough to hear from the elders, even in my little community of Bear River, First Nation or Elsapcook, um, that um, the old people used to talk about smallpox and those type of pandemics. And I'm not talking about 1600s, 1700s. They were talking about like the early 1900s and we had tuberculosis and so forth and all kinds of these. But there's mass graves in my community 
uh, where people were being buried, you know, up to six or more a day. And I was thinking about this in this earlier interview, how there's a strange parallel that, that the, you know, if you go back in history, smallpox and other diseases were intentionally inflicted on Indigenous people and if not starvation to remove those bodies from the land so that land could be just uh, exploited and there's contemporary forms of that happening today um, we know for example that um, any indigenous women who resist um, the exploitation of their lands and sources of water and so forth are highly criminalized. Rather, it's in court injunctions and so forth. And this is happening right across Canada. This is happening in my own backyard. We have the, uh, the Mi'kmaq grandmothers who are struggling against Alton Gas, where they want to scoop out these huge caverns of, uh, that holds uh, salt and throw that salt into the river where they fish and where they've been using that river for um, generations upon generations. And then we have the Wolustuk, uh, beautiful river people, grandmothers also who's been in like a 10 year struggle against this Sisson mine. And this would be in what's known today as New Brunswick. And I'm working with both of these um, grandmothers to connect them with other land defenders. And, um, and um, I'm kind of skipping around here, but um, I have to put a plug in with, for Kairos. I'm working with Kairos on a project. And we had just launched last fall the um, Mother Earth Resource Extraction website. And we're hoping to bring um, some of the land defenders, their stories uh, to that website, uh, hopefully shortly. And so that's just a big segue into this Northern Turtle Island context. Um, what, I, uh, what I will um, just kind of highlight is a, is a couple of things is that there's a temporary form of colonialism and you hear about this and I know that uh, uh, other settler Canadians, they struggle with this. What does she talk about colonialism? And uh, well, there's really other forms of colonialism. If you look at the history of colonialism and, it's, um, and try to step outside of the box that it's not one country taking over a country, there's colonialism within you know, our ancestral homelands. And what people tend to forget here in Canada, what came with colonialism is patriarchy. And these are two academic terms, but it's very male dominated. And those um, structures and governance and structures were imposed on our communities. I won't go in because it's such a, a critical history, but we have a long history of women, indigenous women, uh, below the hierarchy of, of um, uh, you know, uh, any type of rights. They were, you know, really discriminated against. And the last traces of gender discrimination in what we call the Indian Act here in uh, Canada was finally removed from the Indian Act last year and everybody was celebrating. Um, or not everybody, but people were saying, oh, this is a great thing because uh, Indigenous women have been struggling, taking the government to court for years and years and years and years. Well, the Indian Act has been around 1876, even soon, uh, there, there's uh, other colonial pieces of legislation. And I think that where it took to 2019 to get all that gender discrimination out is just something. And so this has uh, led to issues of, as Elizabeth was talking about, the lack of consultation and the lack of consent. And it seems that our treaty rights or indigenous rights or the Universal Declaration of Indigenous Rights are being uh, reinterpreted here in Canada. And when it comes to negotiations, 
the negotiations stop at the leadership, the elected leadership under the Indian Act. And it will, there's no mechanism in there for um, consulting with uh, the grassroots people. And this is what's so problematic here in Canada, that when we start seeing threats to our sources of food and water, our land and water, and we go out to defend that, then all of a sudden we're, you know, we're shocked to find out, oh, well, these have been negotiated, you know, but it's the selected uh, people that, uh, selected leadership that uh, are negotiated with. And I don't mind saying that. And I wrote about this called Decolonize and Decolonization uh, that just came out in the um, South Atlantic Quarterly Journal. And um, so if you want to check that out and I, and, I, and I talk about the politics here in Canada. And what is so um, devastating about this, this divide and conquer strategy between this elected leadership and between the hereditary leadership and between grassroots people is that what is being um, conveyed as uh, contributing to our well-being is these mega projects of economic development. And I want to clarify, we're not anti-development but we sure want sustainable, true, green development, not development that are, is um, causing pollution and, and, and it's raping uh, Mother Earth. Uh, we need more sustainable ways. Um, so this, uh, I'll just wrap this up. I won't spend a whole lot of time. If you have questions, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to answer them, but I wanted to wrap this up. Uh, uh, with um, some of the work that uh, we've been doing with Kairos in terms of getting that um, core, and I never can think of that acronym, but it's this uh, supposed to be this independent body of the government uh, that, to look after corporate uh, responsibility. And last year they had appointed a, uh, um, oh, here it is, the Canadian ombudsperson for responsible business enterprise and we were so hopeful with that uh, appointment however it really had no teeth and why am i talking about this is because the other side of this coin a lot of these companies or foreign companies and canadian companies in particular mining companies are um, um Reacon or um, are, um, what's the best way to put this, are violating human rights and contributing to the violence uh, against indigenous women, if not murder, in other parts of the world, whether it be Guatemala or uh, other parts of Latin America or overseas. And if we cannot hold them accountable for, for those uh, types of uh, atrocities, committed against Indigenous women around the world, we are very pessimist, pessimistic and expectant that here in uh, Canada. And um, I wanted to, just before I close, is to bring your attention also to the film Invasion. And it really demonstrates the point that police security are not here to protect the people but they are here to protect this uh, corporate sector and this resource extractive uh, industry. And, and when the, we're in a pandemic, they're not going to continue uh, or they've, they've postponed or canceled doing anything about the missing and murdered Indigenous women's final inquiry report. And yet the pipeline and other mega development, particularly in British Columbia, were considered an essential service and those workers were allowed to continue to work. So again, the pandemic, just like the smallpox, while the women are, you know, dealing with this pandemic, this, the, they're removed from the land, this mega uh, development is allowed to continue in the, in the extractive industry. And so I'll just leave it with that, um, other than to say, 
we have tremendous, like Elizabeth was saying, these little micro um, defenses, advocacy, and so forth. We need to really pay attention to them because we also have to be careful of not putting Indigenous women in this permanent state of victimhood because they are really the agents of change. Their work is in the forefront uh, against so many things now, but they have such strong resilience and I have such respect um, for the women that I work with and for Indigenous women around the world. Misid Nogama, all my relations. Thank you very much, Sherry, for this important uh, witness and voice from uh, Indigenous people here in Canada. And this is the time when we make these connections, uh, these global connections. So uh, ver a, a very um, deep sense of gratitude for uh, your presentation. And finally, we move to our next, uh, our last speaker. Um, entonces, me da mucho gusto presentar la última presentación. La última so truly, it is a pleasure for me to present the final speaker, Berta Zunica Cáceres. Um, Berta is the coordinate, general coordinator for the Civic Council of Popular Indigenous Groups, Copín. She is the daughter of the Lenca people, Berta Cáceres Flores. Many of you might already know that Berta was a very, very well-known activist. And for many, many years, she was a militant. She fought for her people and she, you know, defended the cause of social justice. Um, just up until the moment of her death, one of the directors and one of the founders, founders or founders of Copin. It, truly, it is an honor to have her daughter with us today, Berta, who carries in her heart, she bears in her heart the spirit and the courage of her mother and her love for her people. And so we want to thank you from the bottom of our heart for speaking to us all the way from Honduras, where you were just today launching the book, eh? the book you wrote about about your mother. And so we are truly very, very happy that it would coincide with this forum and that you would be with us. So thank you very much. And we're just going to hand the microphone over to you right now. Well, sisters and brothers, hello, how are you? Yes. Oops, we are talking about our companion, Berta Cáceres, and in homage to her, we launched a book on the part of the journalist Nina La Carne, and the book is called Who Killed Berta Cáceres, or Who Murdered Her? So we're hoping to get an English version because this book is written exactly what it is we're talking about today. And how, how we went about implementing a hydroelectric power project in, in Copin. And, and we had to look and see what the interests were of the people that were here trying to implement this whole thing. Anyway, the first thing I wanted to talk about you, to talk about, I am very, very interested in all the documentation that you sent to me, especially in, from Elizabeth from Bolivia, my sister from Bolivia, because we have many things in common and we follow the same pattern in what is happening to our people in the generation of the generating energy, taking extractive vism in our countries, the conditions of the people, the implementation of for tourism and things like that, you know? And we do need a great deal of energy to be able to maintain this struggle, maintain this fight. Anyway, in our country, you know eh, what is happening right now. There was the intensification 
of what is happening in here, but also we strengthened the government model that is founded on authoritarianism and militarization of our society in order to guarantee their own interests. So there is no impunity. And so what happens, the whole thing has been exacerbated because of that. And so that has produced a climate of tremendous violence in our country, where we have a people continuing to fight for their rights, to generating and to trying to set in place um, life, living conditions that are acceptable for the people, you know, them to meet their basic rights, based on and founded on justice and equity. For El Copin, El Copin is a group where we work with a great deal of groups, a great deal of people, and it's an organization that we take up and defend the, the rights of the Lenca people, the people who have been oppressed like many other indigenous peoples. But we have had a very difficult uh, struggle, very difficult time. And there was a coup d'etat and we were unable to come out of this context that was created then. And um, I just wanted to say, as we were, we were saying, you know, the pattern is exactly what Elizabeth talked to you about. The whole thing is almost perfect. It's just a perfect um, representation of what she talked about. The whole question of the social conditions of the people, the militarization, oppression, violence, the uh, murderers and the assassinations. In any case, we want to speak out and denounce what has been happening. And there were 49 projects for developing this type of energy in our territory alone. Nobody was consulted and many of them were implemented and they all follow the same pattern. So these processes in uh, Terrio Blanco, where we tried to resist uh, the hydroelectric project. And it was a very, very, big project, many of the communities that were there, Toma Garcia, Thomas Garcia, and we would imagine that many of the people that we were working with, you already know. And so I am not going to speak at length about um, my own disappointments, but I'm going to talk to you about in this conversation we're having that there is one actor in the generation of these social and environmental projects. It's international funds, international funding in the electric dam and we have in Wasaka, which is in our territory here that was done by them. Then we had the presence of um, in this struggle, in this fight, we were thinking that, um, oops, we would generate a type of dialogue with the banks that are funding these groups. We're talking about the Centro America, Banco Centro Americano in Basi, BCEI, they call it. And another one of the banks that participated was the World Bank, a bank and a fund, a development fund from Holland and a bank, a development bank from Ireland. Anyway, there was a report from these experts that was, they produced this investigation and my mother, Berta Cáceres, followed this project and she followed the way the structures were being put in place. They didn't have the economic resources necessary so it was carried out and thanks to the international funding and this international funding is due that we wanted to increment the different actions that attack systems of violence at work in Copin and also all of the um, anger and all the hostility that was uh, demonstrated towards Berta Cáceres. So anyway, we have been leading this fight for justice for her 
and we are trying the best we can trying to maintain these spaces of dialogue. However, these great big banks and these great big finance institution, financial institutions, the structure and the behavior of the companies in Honduras that they are funding, not only that, but they say that these communities are not indigenous. Some European banks, multinationals said that these communities are not indigenous people and yet therefore they had no obligation to consult. They were not. And so another thing that they highlighted is that the community in Copin um, is uh, an organization that prones violence and uh, we were, wanted to criminalize the different people that belong to us and we wanted to support all of the actions of um, before the courts and to free up the people that had been put into jail. And this happened in two different instances. I, obviously because of the impact that this whole crime has had upon our people, we were thinking that this was the opportunity for us to to expulse these banks, get rid of them, or at least demand that they would leave immediately. However, they all looked at one another and they said, you have no responsibility, they said. And they weren't responsible for all of this extraction of the natural resources, but it was the companies from your own country, they said. So they said, we have no responsibility at all. So we, we tried to set up a process where we could bring justice and with all of the limitations that we set in place with the various intermediaries who are going to help us and these companies. Uh, uh, okay, to try and develop this project. There was a communication specialist from the environment and the other is the former chief of the former head of security and the other it was from oh my gosh one of the professors teaching the police in the military he had a, a very very high position so these are all indication that these crimes created by the by the companies and by the state government of course has created a great deal of harm for the state of Honduras. And then we began campaigns, international, international solidarity campaigns with these big companies and these banks. And so more than a year and a half later, the, Hol the, the bank from Holland left, then from Finland, and then a German company for coming for the turbines. After that, we were able to succeed a legal process, set in place a legal process against the Dutch bank where we brought them to court because of negligence with regards to their investments. And this was proved, first of all, like the, like my, like the, the other speaker said, in this country, we do not respect the right to consultation. And not only do we not respect it, we even try to falsify these processes in order to bring out or, or to squelch this struggle for fairness and justice and equity. And then we had the right to consultation. And every time we tried to do it, we proposed it. Oh, no, we said the people have to be consulted. So we asked them. We say, well, we ask them, but all they do is falsify the information that they receive from the people. They don't tell the truth. The indigenous people therefore don't have a chance. This is a, a battle. It's not an easy battle that we are living. It's in the communities, so poor, so marginalized. And they're just kind of like almost, you know, down and we're tramping on them, stamping them with our feet. And then we've got these great big companies, but our young people don't have resources. They haven't had any possibility for education. It's very difficult because we're trying to advance these processes just the same. Something positive that I guess I could say 
is that um, we know that um, this is a very strange behavior on the part of these companies and the bosses or the heads of these companies who many times get hands on international funding. So they're using him, especially against uh, climate change. So we go, we, go, we go against, you know, the rights of the communities. They're there helping them. This is what I wanted to share with you and I wanted to share with those who have gone before me, my sisters have gone before me, that this is a terribly difficult struggle in Honduras where our rights are not, the indigenous people are not respected at all, their rights are not respected, and in the time of the quarantine, for example, this activism, they were allowed to continue to work, the Secretariat of Natural Resources and of the Environment let them just go on so that their companies would be able to um, ask for license and permission in the midst of this pan in the pandemic. So they got, they got financial help and they have just closed their eyes. They're blind to the life of the victims and what everything is happening to them, what we are doing to them. There are no rules, there are no uh, norms to be followed on the international level either. Many governments have become involved in violent types of projects against the communities of indigenous peoples. Very vulnerable people. And what we have is, you know, the right to fresh air and the right to fresh water. So this is our search for justice. And my sister Cassidy, who said that in Bolivia, there are many, many, many com communities like that that exist all over Latin America, South America, and in uh, Central America. So these are all of the peoples that we are called to help to create possibilities for them to come into their own culture, to elect their own leaders and attack and go against these terrible projects that are being put in place by the mining companies. Okay, thank you, Berta. And thank you, Elizabeth and Tashiri. So we thank you very much for having shared your stories with us. And especially all of the work that you're doing to protect our Mother Earth. So now we have time for a little bit of dialogue and some of the questions. And if anybody has any questions, just write them in the box there and uh, we'll take them. The first question is addressed to all of you. What can we do here in our own places in order to give greater visibility and to be able to support you in your struggles with regards to extractivism? How can the ONGs, how can the NGOs and others, we who have benefited for our privilege of being white or having been born up here in the north. So how can we help you? So I don't know if there's anybody who would like to answer that. Let me just jump in here. Um, the visibility of the struggles and, and the voice of the women in general. Oops is we are excluded, our voice is not heard in these means of communication. Mm, it's very difficult to hear her. Okay, especially, you know, we will kill the women, assassinate them. Oops. There is a great noise going on all the time. I'm sorry about that. I can't always hear her. Oops. So there are many different actions that are being undertaken in all of the countries and all of the regions to try and open up channels so that we might be able to amplify, broaden our possibility for visibility. Like what is happening in very remote areas can also be made known and communicated. This is what we have to strengthen and see that how can, how can we can make these voices broaden or more well known. Then we've got the people in the South. I think that this is a huge challenge you're talking about. It's huge, it's enormous really, and we have a challenge. 
uh, we have stitches. Oh, I don't get her. She's fading out all the time. I'm very sorry. So I get mad, you know, sometimes when we say we're, ha we're making noise in the north, so they'll listen to us. That's not what happens. It's very complex because we're, all we're doing is maintaining the colonial structure and feeding into it, right? So it seems to me that this is very complex. However, I believe that mm, another fundamental element is the question of water and in the community. This has a serious echo in the rest of the communities. So yes, it's a key issue, despite that we have to try to bring the two dimensions, the local with the global. If we could do that, that would help. If we lose a lake in Bolivia, I mean, this affects the whole world. Therefore, I think we have to be more aware, more conscious of the fact of what it means on the environment. It's not just the community doesn't have access to to water. I was telling you about the whole chain of things that, that happened because of that. This is an ongoing permanent solution that we have to find. Do you have anything to add? Are you asking? Uh, just if you had anything to add, um, if uh, not, we can move. This is, I agree with Elizabeth, it's a very complex, um, in practical terms, people ask this all the time, what can we do to help, what can we do to help? And, you know, it, it is a very complex dynamic. Uh, but I do want to bring your attention again, and it's been in the chat. Um, one of the things that I've been working with Kairos with is on this uh, Mother Earth Resource Extraction Hub. And it's a way to connect um, and support women from around the world. We're hoping eventually they had their first launch that focused on Latin America. Uh, and um, we're hoping to bring a Canadian perspective to that, uh, to provide the space for women to share their stories, their strategies, and to network with one another and to support research. But I would always suggest you know, trying to identify anybody, uh, any groups locally, and to, to, um, to very practical things. You know, there was this wonderful story of this uh, ally, this friend of mine, and she had seen some uh, women um, setting up um, some type of, I don't want to say blockade, but and I don't want to say protest. Here, we always say we're land defenders, we're not protesters. But these grandmothers were at work to address uh, this company, and she wanted to find out what that was all about. And she just kept visiting and, you know, and she was wondering, what can I do? What can I do? And someone said, we need firewood. And she said, well, that's something that I can do. And something as simple as that. Um, but I think um, we need to focus on these stories. And um, Elizabeth is right these stories often go unheard. And even here in Canada, you will never hear the stories of the struggles on the ground. You'll hear the, um, you know, the official versions of what is happening. And to really bring attention to this. And the other thing is, you know, for those in privileged positions of power, I'd say, look in your own backyard. And I would ask yourself, what is, your citizenship engagement process. Are you being consulted? If there's a development happening that you think will threaten the natural and or the integrity of the ecological systems that you live in, what is the citizenship engagement for that? And um, anyways, these are just some practical things. And again, I draw your attention to that website. I'm so excited about it. Uh, because I think it's only through webinars like this, international learning, that we can exchange ideas and try to figure out how can we support one another. Uh, any fundraisers you see on social media and so forth, particularly uh, 
fundraisers to um, hire lawyers or to protect women, particularly once they're arrested, or to investigate murders would so be deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Muchas gracias. Um, our second question is actually to Sherry, um, but I believe Bertha and Elizabeth also mentioned similar things in their context. Um, so perhaps they could add after. Um, the question is, how can we address specific comments from government officials, uh, such as the government of Alberta, who openly admit that they're pushing through with mega projects at a time when people cannot gather in mass protest? I, that goes to my, um, my earlier statement, my opening statement about the pandemic being used. However, look at what is happening in the United States. It's taken, a, uh, and it's taken um, off here in Canada. Um, I wish there was that much outrage over the murder of black and indigenous women. And however, this is not stopping people from going out into protest. Alberta is a very, um, very interesting province. And what I would do is try to connect with Indigenous people that are living in that province and in that struggle. Um, one of the other uh, organizations is Indigenous in Climate Action, it's Indigenous Climate Action. It's an Indigenous Climate Action Group. And um, I think that Indigenous women are being held hostage between this argument between these colonial, uh, these contemporary forms of colonialism between the province of British Columbia uh, and Alberta. And I think you always have to counteract with the facts and the harm and the unsubstantiated science of, of uh, not to mention how that is not going to resolve climate change and to stay on that with a counter narrative. And I think this would apply to my sisters in the South of um, who's always constantly to get this, to get the word out, they may have something to add. <laughs> Um, Berta, Elizabeth, ¿tienen algo que agregar? Eh, la pregunta es, ¿cómo podemos seguir resistiendo? Anything to add? So how do you want to, how do you continue resisting with these governments and for the people who cannot get out there and, you know, express their, demonstrate their, their discontent? What do you do? Elizabeth, are you gone? Yeah. In reality, what uh, I was saying and what you were saying, Shelley, is the truth. The capacity to mobilize beyond, beyond you know, what the, what the pandemic is causing. But we have been militarized from hither and yon, and we are so scared now here. Ooh, they have total control of the state and the police are working hand in hand with the government. Oh my gosh, her, her microphone is very, very bad. I'm sorry. Hmm. You were talking about what is happening in Honduras, but the permissions, you know, the, the girls are, are getting permission. They're doing vir virtual meetings and things like that. It's getting out there. But the, we find ourselves in a situation Oh, kind of like a, of war, a war and this visibility, therefore, if we, if we become too visible, they're going to be able to attack us. They'll know who we are. So, it, however, I think that our people, my own people, like I'm talking about, and I'm sure that in the other places is the same, they do not allow us to come together and they force us to remain isolated because that's our history. That's part of who we are. So we, anything that we have been able to obtain or attain is because we fought for us. The forms of protest are dying. 
and our social fabric has to be strengthened, as I said earlier. And in our case, for example, like the indigenous communities are they're closing down our indigenous spaces, our indigenous lands. But now there's a protocol that's been established where we say that with the mining companies that are coming in and ooh, they come in with their own protocol and they establish them and they impose them upon us. The next question is for Elizabeth and for Berta. Because of the examples from your region, there is a very strong interaction between the patriarchal establishment and also the extra extractivism. So you try to have to work together so that this feminine struggle this the struggle of the women and the abuses and the uh, the abuses and everything going against extravagant extractivism i'm going to just start and then i'll hand over the microphone to berta the last 10 years in bolivia we have our own structures that have been put in place however the collectives of women and of indigenous women campesinas throughout all of the country have banded together, have come together. And so we're fighting against the mining companies that are coming in and doing so much destruction to our lands. So there are many situations of injustice that exist and the urban alliance at the local level is very strong. I mean, we can be in solidarity Oh boy, it's very tough, I'm sorry. Like, we have a com we have a, a, a place in the south of Balabi who are fighting. There's a great deal of violence being done to the people. Sorry. We are trying to set in place alliances that would help us to broaden our message and to have it heard, you know. And there are movements of resistance that are far more sustainable. Sorry, I didn't get it all. I'm very sorry about that. Berta? For us, it's been a, a learning process, a very serious learning curve. And this is the same thing as for the indigenous groups of women, and we are suffering the same type of internal oppression at the local level. And it's very, you know, it's deeply rooted here. I think that for the organizations that believe in the coming of justice, the promotion of justice, I think it is important that we would be able to move forward, advance toward um, a feminine justice against patriarchy. For us in El Copin, with all of the support that we receive from our companions and from our colleagues elsewhere we are working together because this can only happen together it's a struggle it has to be kind of integral where where many many different types of struggles kind of join together not just to uh, claim our rights or or, or, or the defense of our rights but what we're looking for is setting in place a democratic process in Honduras. Mm -hmm. That has made it possible for the movement to broaden its scope, to be more articulate. But we also have many types of challenges that are we are up against in our own country. So here, there is a place where you can speak out um, the indigenous women, and other groups of indigenous women and also we have the young women the students we're trying to bring them all together to enter into a dialogue but it certainly isn't an easy job and not everything has been resolved just because they come together and we don't live close to one another we're all over the place little small groups and sometimes we start saying something and articulating our thoughts and and we ask ourselves, how can we, 
how can we deal with all of the challenges that we are up against in our country? But these are important exercises, we say, and we have to go back to these struggles. And many of the contributions that were made and within the Honduran context, we also have the same realities where we are trying to articulate our struggle, our fight, and the, the desire to go to, hit, to go to go forward together and create spaces where we come together for dialogue. Okay, thank you. Society learn from the grandmothers in resistance in uh, Nova Scotia. You're muted, Sherry. Can you repeat that? I missed some of that. Oh, no problem. Um, what can we um, and should Canadian society learn from the grandmothers in resistance? Uh, I think there's a lot to learn. Um, I know that in both cases here on the East Coast, there's been... Um, um, there's been some successes there's like two steps uh forward and six back kind of thing um one of the things again i would say is how law favors uh corporatism or the corporations i seen in uh it wasn't in the official question and answer uh um, block here, but in the chat block, uh, looking at, um, you know, uh, United Nations Treaty on Human Rights. And, but as we well know, we have the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and here we are, you know, uh, over 10 years later, and still struggling to have those uh, rights. I don't, I don't mean to sound uh, pessimistic, but uh, what I'm trying to get at here is what you can learn from the grandmothers is the legal inequities in terms of trying to uh, struggle against a mega project. And particularly even uh, what's so contradictory with governments here in Canada, like you have the federal government, then you have the provincial government. And in our case, in Nova Scotia or Mi'kma'ki, but now known today as Nova Scotia, is that the government acts as an, uh, the regul the the regul how can I say the regulatory body. They regulate these. They're the ones who give out permits and so forth. But at the same token, they're advocating for the very companies that they're supposed to be regulating. And this is a major contradiction. And even in the case of Alton Gas, um, and there was other, there's other situations like this across Canada, when the evidence comes up that this is not viable, or this is gonna be harmful to the fish, or this is gonna be harmful to um, the, the, the natural ecologies, the, there's this concept of mitigation so that's not true consultation. It's like there's no room to say no. Oh, we're going to mitigate that. And and as Indigenous women and as Indigenous people, it's like, you know, if I get cancer in my thumb, that doesn't mean I'm not going to get cancer in the rest of my body. And that's the issue with um, the environment. And so, you know, I think there's a lot that you can learn. And the other thing that... Um, with a lot of Indigenous women, they are so rooted in um, their ancestral ways and ceremony and so forth. And one of the things I found with the grandmothers in both Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, the Wolustic and the Mi'kmaq grandmothers, they're very much rooted in ceremony. And what I mean by that, it's, um, it's not a, um, it's not just a routine thing. There's some incredible stories where, um, and I'll leave this for the mere website to, to come, to be coming soon. There's some incredible stories how the um, 
they're just incredible stories of how the natural elements uh, help them in their um, in their um, fight. So anyway, so I would say law, respect for ceremony, and the but really take a look at law in the decolonize and decolonization piece. I am a little bit critical of the human rights because as we know, human rights too can be manipulated to favor the corporations. And um, there seems to be a hierarchy of rights where corporate rights supersede basic fundamental human rights to water, shelter, and so forth, and food. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todas. Tristemente se nos acaba el tiempo. Solo les quiero recordar a los participantes. Time has come to an end and I would like to thank the participants for all of the wonderful work that they did in sharing with us today. We're going to send you an email with the report and the recording of this meeting. And We'll be able to improve anything that we can in the future for future meetings. And now I'm going to ask Anne-Marie if she would kindly bring this meeting to conclusion. Thank you, everybody. Many thanks, Sherry. Thank you, Berta. Thank you, Elizabeth. It was very inspiring to hear you and very, um, very moving and very energizing. So thank you so much. We also want to thank our translators. It wasn't always it's so easy, uh, some little technical problems and things like that. But thank you, Magali and Pat, who helped us to, for everybody to hear what our wonderful panelists were saying. Um, don't forget to register for the next webinar, which is next um, a week today, in fact. Um, and more information is in the chat window. Maybe, um, Victoria, you already said that. Um, you, and you'll be receiving a recording. Um, along with the recording, we're going to send you also a little survey just to get some feedback, which we would really appreciate. Uh, if you want to understand a little bit more about the Jesuit Forum and our process and so on, um, there is a, a dialogue guide that we have produced on La Dato Si, on Care for Our Common Home, and another one that's on Living with Limits, Living Well, which deals with many of these similar questions as today and that uh, you'll get a, a link in the chat there as well for those. Um, uh, interestingly, we are producing a dialogue guide, um, listening to indigenous voices, which um, will be available later and we hope in September. So watch for that and we'll talk to Sherry about that as well. Um, so, um, the, the, uh, finally, the, we just released an issue of our um, small publication, Open Space, and um, Open Space, um, this particular issue, we're looking at the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and how it can be understood as an acute crisis, obviously, unfolding within a much deeper um, chronic crisis, revealing the fragility and injustice at a time marked by both growing social inequality and ecological devastation. So um, it's just a, a short uh, piece, but um, there's a link there in, um, in the, ch in the uh, chat. Um, so, and thank you uh, to our friends from Canadian Jesuits International and from Kairos Canadian Ecumenical Justice Initiatives for their participation today. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you again, Elizabeth, Berta, and uh, Sherry. Thanks to everybody who came. All the best. Goodbye. Thank you.